It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Doris Matthias Gutentag. We're here in your beautiful home in Yerushalayim. And Doris, you are so unique. You were one of the very fortunate to be on the kinder transport. Yes. So could you tell us a bit about where you were born and your family coming from Germany? I was born in 1929 in Germany, that town called Treysa, which is a very small town. In my time, the Kehille was very small. There were only two or three children. It used to be that you used to have a Jewish school. And what usually you have in the, in the from Kehille. But uh, it had diminished a lot. And uh, in 1939, before the war, uh, my mother arranged for me to go with a kinder transport to England. And can you mention a little bit about your parents and your grandparents? My parents, my, <coughs> my, my, first of all, my father was a big believer in, in Germany. He didn't think that anything would happen to the Jews in Germany. In con contrast to his sister, who in 1928 said, Germany is not good for the Jews, and she went to America. Uh, but my father believed in the Germans and he got on well with them. He, is, he was, uh, what do you call, Eisenhandler. I uh, don't know what you call it now, but he sold anything from a nail to a tractor. And he traveled a lot all around the, the area and mixed with Jen. And in fact, um, uh, it said uh, no, 8th of November, November 1938 in the morning around lunch and the whole crowd of Nazis stood in front of our house with stones in their hands but they didn't do anything and one shouted out oh leave him alone he's a good Jew but was your father ever in the in the military in the army in the German army yes he was in the German army and he lost an eye in, in the army, and he was, after Kristallnacht, they uh, arrested all the men. On the 10th of November they came, 7 o'clock in the morning, took my father away, and he was in Buchenwald. And he was released because he was fought in the First World War. We have a picture of your parents. <coughs> A very beautiful picture. So this, what year was this picture taken of your parents? Uh, 1926. <coughs> and Doris, can I ask, did you it was your family, you were brought up in a from, in a from, um, orthodox family? Yeah, yes. Yeah. <coughs> and was there a shul in, in the there town? There was a shul in Trasa. there was a mikveh? Yeah, there was a mikveh. The mikveh is still there, it seems. The shul was destroyed and they've built a house instead. You and saw the mikvah, huh? And your grandparents, were they, were they born in Germany as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's quite yes. a few generations. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. They came to live with us <coughs> in 1937. But my father's brother, who lived with his parents, decided he said, they lived in, in a smaller place where only three Jewish families left. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Oh. The, the windows were broken. So here you have a picture like of your your grandmother. Yeah. And what do you remember about your grandmother? Uh, they, they came to live with us. Uh, my grandfather was very weak. And he, uh, he was blind. He, could, he couldn't see very well. My father used to carry him up and down the stairs every day. 
And uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, she was okay. She looked after him, and, uh, and he he died in November 1938. And growing up, did you mainly mix with Jewish children, or, or? there were two Jewish children and uh, three Jewish children? One was a boy. He he eventually went, <coughs> went to a boarding school in Frankfurt. Because he suffered a lot from anti-Semitism. I never suffered any anti-Semitism in Germany. Did you have a lot of German friends, a lot of I school friends? I had one German friend, next door neighbor, and she came when the children went, went to Germany. She insisted on coming. She was then 91, I think, then? And this, was, this is a picture of your do you remember her name? Uh, uh, her name now was Trump. Malta Correll. Oh, you can't say you met her name. You didn't know her name or? And here's a picture of you with your parents on a, on a horse. Yeah. And here's your, your mum. And growing up, did you have very pleasant memories of growing up in in the town and... No, not really. I never suffered anything. But you had pleasant memories? Yeah, yeah. And the school and you went to, was it a, a government it, school? Until it came to... when Hitler started, in 1933. Uh, when my mother's mother came, was staying with us for a while. And uh, we were looking out an upstairs window. And the Hitler youth marched through the streets. <laughs> and my grandmother said, if only she wouldn't have to live through this. And three days later, she died. And, uh, I mean, but that's the only sort of thing that I felt un until 38. And did you go to a government school? Yes. And I, had to, I had to go to school on Shabbos. But I didn't have to write. And you never felt any anti-Semitism? No, no, not until 38. So we have a wonderful picture of your first day at school. This is, this is really, really amazing. And you got a very special gift, if you could. <laughs> Who sent this gift to you? <laughs> this was sent from Germany recently. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, a rip. Well, it's because they uh, I gave the ch gave the children who went to Germany. Then I gave them a photo of that, and uh, so the ch the teachers bought this. Shimon asked if it's still good. Huh? Shimon asked if it's still good. And and you remember your first day at school? Uh, not really. <laughs> yeah. Tell them about your last day in school. The what? Tell what happened last as the last day in school? And they sent you home. Uh, they sent me out uh, uh, the last day, uh, the last day in school, uh, the 9th of November, 38. I was uh, sent home from school. I was told that the rest of the lesson isn't for me. And I went home and uh, uh, we used to share a newspaper with <coughs> two elderly ladies. My mother sent me to take the newspaper to them. And uh, while I was there, my mother came to fetch me, so I said, where did she come? She didn't say anything, and we went through back streets, we didn't go through the main road. And I kept asking, why are we walking here? But she wouldn't say anything. And then when I got home, there was the Nazi standing in front of our house. And what do you remember of Kristallnacht? Of what? Of the Kristallnacht. What do you... It's Kristallnacht. Uh, I said, they said they were come. We didn't go to bed. And we put three sets of clothing on in case we'd have to uh, run away. But you could feel, you could feel yeah, the atmosphere. Yeah, that was, was the atmosphere. 11 o'clock in the evening, we had our next door neighbors, this lady, who <coughs> lived next door to us. Uh, one of the door, there was a no, there was a very narrow passageway between our two houses, and we both had windows facing. 
and uh, there was a knock on our window, one of their daughters, and she said, her father's just come home from the pub, and they've called off the 12 o'clock strike. So she says, you can go to bed. But, uh, I mean, we went to bed eventually, but we didn't, because uh, we didn't sleep. And then at seven o'clock morning, the knock at the door, and uh, the police was there. All the Nazis, I don't know who it was, took my father away. And uh, they were told to bring lunch at twelve o'clock uh, <coughs> to the station. So the men were all there, and. Uh, they were told to come back and pick the dishes up at two o'clock. And they went, and uh, the men weren't there. They asked, where are they? They didn't know. And uh, a few days later, my mother and another lady went to the Gestapo, local Gestapo to find out where they are. But I don't think anybody knew anything locally anyway, but <coughs> living opposite us there was, was a Nazi and he sat in this window <coughs> most of the day and we had to be careful. We, these neighbors that we had, they had a bakery and we used to get our bread from them. My mother used to bake the chalice in the oven. Uh, and they were very good, and then also they knocked on the door and said, if we need anything, the daughters will get it for us. And I think here you have a, a wonderful picture of um, several Goetia families continued their friendship. They knocked on the back door and offered to do shopping and help with anything you ne the family needed. And you can see how close the, the apartments were. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. So no, there's a doll there They were now. threatened as well. Tell them they were threatened. Hmm? Tell them they were threatened, the neighbours. That's the alleyway. That's the, my mother said that gate wasn't there when she lived there. But that's the, between the two houses. Here's the alleyway. And do you, well, do you remember the, when the shawl was destroyed? It was destroyed no, on Crystal Night? No, the, the next morning the Sifatoira were rolled up. <laughs> The shoe was right at the bottom of the street. The Sifatoria were all rolled up. And I don't know when they burnt the shoe down. That must have been through the night, I don't know. But you, were so, you, were very, you were only about eight years old at this time. Yeah. It must have been terrifying. Yeah, yeah. From then on, life was terrifying. And Doris, did you have any siblings? No. You were the only child? So your parents must have been very protective of you, very. And were you scared to walk in the streets? I'm sure you must have been very... Yeah, yeah. Uh, didn't go out very much. And, uh, it was <coughs> life wasn't easy anymore. And also my father had a shop in the house. And one day they told us to stay in the room and they emptied the shop out. They just came in and, yeah. and looted. They. So how did, your fam how did your family make a living? How did they...? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we had money in the bank, I suppose. And uh, we, we had a comfortable life. We weren't rich, but we were comfortable. And uh, <coughs> my father still tried to get in touch with people who owed him money and what. But some people were helpful and some people weren't. <coughs> and he also he had a terrific uh, car accident. He used to ride the motorbike. This was well, this was years ago, before long before that. And uh, he had an accident with a car. And the people, the witnesses who saw it, they said it was deliberate. Okay. 
And when your father was arrested, and then he was uh, with the Jewish men, they sent him away to Buchenwald. Yeah. And how long was he there for? He was <coughs> for about a month. But you didn't know where he had gone, or? No, no. Yeah, I don't know, I think that a few times my mother went. The wife was always my mother together with somebody else. When they went to Kassel to the Gestapo to find out where the Ben Mare what was happening, and I don't know what. And um, my grandfather was sniffed at the end of November '38. There were no men in town, so uh, she wouldn't know what to do. And uh, first, is, <coughs> she couldn't touch with the local authorities about and they said first they agreed to a burial and then said no. And uh, it was yes and no, backwards and forwards. And also my mother tried to get my father to come back, at least for the Levaya. Also it was backwards and forwards, yes and no. And uh, in the end, it was no. And, he was, <coughs> he was buried in Kassel. I don't know anything about how it happened or what. How she managed it all, I don't know. I don't remember anything. And I know that he knew that he was buried in Kassel. <coughs> and then your father came back? My father came back. The one gentleman came back before him. He had the papers on him that he'd fought in the First World War. And he told my mother and all the other women whose husbands were in the First World War. And my mother again had to go to the Gestapo and present the papers. And a week later, my father came home. And it was just before the end of the Shloshim, so he still said Shiva. It must have been very emotional for you and your mother to see your father. Yeah. He came home, I think, in the middle of the night. And uh, when I woke up in the morning, he was bald. He had shaved his, shaved his hair off. And Doris, during this time, you weren't, you weren't allowed to go to school? No. So the last day I went to school was November 38. So did you read or did your mother teach you a little bit? Yeah, my father tried to teach me a little bit, yeah. And the German school friends, did they ever come to visit you or to...? No, they couldn't. This, this one, I mean, the only one I was really friendly with was, was this neighbor. And uh, she said that she saw me leave. And she wanted to say goodbye to me, but she didn't have the courage to. She knew that she wasn't allowed to. So... Uh, and uh, when they put these stopple stones up, they wrote about it in the local newspaper. And the sister of this lady saw it and she recognized the name. And she, she was born in 38, she was only a baby. So she didn't know us, but they said that the, the parents always talked about us. Funnily, I'm sure very funnily. Wow. After the war, I wrote to them to ask if maybe my parents left, left something, but, then, but they said no, it was too obvious they were being watched. Sure, it's unbelievable. And can I just ask, so your, your father came back and it was just now, and when did your parents decide to send you on the kinder transport? Uh, I'm not sure when it was, but first my mother tried to, in Holland, this cousin of hers, the stepmother of this person, she lived in Holland. So my mother contacted her. Marisha? Yeah, that, uh, uh, they can come to Holland. And she agreed. And then afterwards she wrote, children aren't allowed to go to private homes anymore. So, and they have to go to a hostel, and she wouldn't advise it. 
one of the, the girls from Tresa, who I was friendly with, she went to Holland. What happened to her, I don't know. So after Holland fell through, so that's when my mother got in touch with her sister in, in England. And this gentleman agreed to take me in. So could you just describe, I know it's difficult, but what happened when your family finally made, your parents made the decision that you're going to go to England? Well, it was, couldn't have been easy for them. The most difficult decision? My father took me to the train to the kinder transport. My mother didn't come to the station. And when you say goodbye to your mother, yeah. that, must, that must have been one of the hardest well, moments you know, of your I life. I didn't realize, I thought, you know, I'd meet them again. Although when uh, the world was declared, on the 1st of September 39, I said, I'll never see my parents again. And that's what happened. So what, what date did your father take you to on the 15th of May, 38. And I arrived in England on the 18th of May. <coughs> in 39. 39. And he took you to the train station and then the train went to Holland. I went to Holland. We went by boat overnight. And were you with your father when you went to Holland? Or no. You, he just took you to the train? Went, we went from Hanover, I think, in Germany. The transport left from Hanover in Germany, that's when we had to say, say and goodbye did you, to our did parents. Did you know anybody on the train? No. You must have been very scared. It's, yeah. You were only nine years old. I mean, when I know everybody was talking about whom they're going to, what's happening, and I said that I'm going to an aunt, I was the envy of the, of the people on the train, because they didn't know who they were going to. And they didn't have any family. They were picked up by strangers. And that train journey, did you recognize anybody from your town or from...? Mm, I, don't, I, don't mean we were, I don't know whether there were any other people on the train. We were, I don't know how many carriages there were. Had you ever been on a train before? Yes. Yes, we used to go to visit my grandparents. And when you said goodbye to your father, it also must have been, you never knew that you weren't going to see him again. I never thought that I'd never see them again. But it must have been also very emotional to say yeah, goodbye. Yeah, of course. <coughs> and I suppose it was worse for my parents. And in Hanover, uh, how long were you there for? Where? In Hanover. No, I don't, I don't remember. I think we went straight to the train. It had to be there at a certain time, I suppose. And then the, the boat? Do you remember going on the boat? Yes, I remember getting on the boat. I remember feeling sick all night. <laughs> and the people who took you on the boat, those who were helping, were they very caring? Yeah, yes. Yeah. On the train, also the Gestapo kept walking through, but they never did anything or said anything. Nobody molested us on the train. Had you ever been on a boat before? No. So it must be a little bit of an adventure. <laughs> but were you were you scared and petrified? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Never was something. And how long were you on the boat for? Uh, it was overnight. It wasn't a long journey. It wasn't a long journey, no. I can't remember the times. But we arrived uh, in Harwich in England. <coughs> and then we went on a train to London. And in London they were <coughs> went into a big hall. And we got uh, biscuits and uh, something to drink. <coughs> and then eventually they started calling out children's names. And you never knew English? And you know English? Uh, nothing. 
And who came to fetch you at the train station? Uh, m my aunt, Auntie Fanny, together with one of the girls. And she was looking after them, and I didn't know them. You, had you ever met Auntie Fanny before? And yes. And she used to have to come while she was uh, in England. She used to have to come every year back to Germany, something to do with a passport. She had a German passport. And she used to stay with us. She never married. Hmm? She never married. She never married? Yeah. And was she was she very uh, very caring and very loving? Yeah. yeah. So here is a picture with you and uh, your auntie Fanny. And the person that you, if you could just speak a little bit about the home that you were when you came to England, in Golders Green. It was uh, an apartment. I mean, I'd never been in an apartment, but we used to live in a house. <coughs> and uh, this was in a downstairs four-room apartment. I ch uh, shared a room together with the two other girls. Okay, so who were the two other girls, if you could? The two other girls, they were called Ruth and Marion Kugelman. And uh, this, uh, my aunt, Auntie Fanny, was looking after them. So, Doris, can you just mention why they came to be with the, your aunt Fanny? What the, a bit of a because background. Because their parents had died, and an uncle of their, bro their father's brother had promised to look after them if anything happened to him. Um, so he did, but he didn't know what to do with them. He was by himself a bachelor. And, a and he remembered that uh, in Germany, in Berlin, where they lived, uh, a cousin of the stepmothers used to visit quite often. So he got in touch with her and asked whether she'd come to look after the girls until he found a different solution. Well, they never found a different solution. Things just stayed like that until he got married in 1947. And can and I that was before the 44, I think, he got married. So when you arrived, the, the two girls were there already? Yeah. And what were their names? Marion and Ruth Kugelman. And what ages were they? They were, well, was, uh, Ruth was two years older than me. And Marion was another two years old, so she was one, eleven, twelve. She just passed away now, about two months ago. Marion just passed away. And did you develop a very close uh, friendship? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were we called ourselves cousins. This was it was simplest thing, but we were like sisters. And and there was no favoritism showed or. No. So having the two the two sisters must have been a big help for to integrate. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, they had lived in England already for 1936, I think they came to England. And did they help you learn English, or did they help there you? Were, a lot of a lot of people tried to help me with English, and it didn't work. And <coughs> at the beginning of the war, the schools weren't ready to, to open. They didn't have shelters yet. But, so the teachers used to come to the house. It took a few, with four or five children in the same area. And uh, I had a teacher who was very good, very sympathetic. And from her, I learned English. It was not Jewish. There were no Jewish schools then. And the family that you were, it was also from and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you go to the show? Yes. Which kahila did you go to? Uh, it's called monks show. <laughs> the original monks. Yeah. They got married. My parents got married. 
There was a Germ there was a German Kahila. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And during the the war years, um, did you go to school eventually? Or yeah, yes, yes. <coughs> I can't remember how long it was before school opened, but there was school. Yes, yes, and. Uh, there, there was, was in London during the Blitz, there were air raid sirens every night, and bombings. And one morning I was going to school and the children were coming back. I said, where are you going? There's no school. <coughs> They've been bombed, all the windows are out. So again, we didn't have school for about a week or so, and they repaired it. And we went back. And Doris, during this time, the only way that you could communicate with your parents was by sending them letters. Yeah. So could you speak a little bit about... Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, a one, well, <coughs> you could write twice a week. And uh, in November 42, my mother wrote, they're going away they won't be able to write. So uh, I didn't know what was happening, where they were or what. And I can't remember when it was, but I got a letter <coughs> from a gentleman who came from the same town as we did. From, he was in Switzerland. And he wrote, but my parents are in Theresienstadt. And that my mother's working in the kitchen so they don't go hungry. And he was there as well. And the, Swi the Germans wanted something from the Swiss, I, did, I think trucks or something, I can't remember what. But the Swiss wanted something in return. So they released a few people from the concentration camps. And was he one of them that was released? He was one of those who was. Uh, uh, so that's all I knew until uh, after the war. I think your father made a million in Theresienstadt as well. Yeah, we, after, uh, after the war I got a letter from a lady. Uh, my mother used to give my address in England to anybody whom she thought would be able to get in touch with me. And this lady wrote that uh, my father organized me in your name uh, in 44 for Shoshone and Yom Kippur. But for Sukkot they weren't there anymore. And uh, uh, October 44, they were sent to uh, Auschwitz. And here's, you have a picture of some of the letters that you did with the, the Red Cross. And this one was from July 1942 from August 1942. How often did you used to send and receive letters from your parents? Uh, twice a month. <coughs> so you must have looked so forward to getting these letters. Yeah, yeah. It was the only key and there were no telephones, you couldn't... No, you could even if you were telephones you couldn't get in touch. And um, there was, when did you hear the news that your, your parents were taken to, uh, to Auschwitz? It was after the war? After the war, yes. <coughs> um, there was a final big Kindertransport reunion. It was in 1999, after 60 years. And there was a gentleman there from one of the associations. And uh, he said that they've got the dates of what happened to my parents when. And he sent them to me and that was, that said that in October 44 they were sent to Auschwitz. And they, that uh, Yad Vashem has got the same information. So it was the final... I got this information but I haven't got it anymore. I don't know what happened to it. But it's still a Zetia Vashem and it's... And can I just ask, the family that you stayed with in Golders Green, 
was yeah. a, it was just a amalgamation was sort of yeah. but you all got on you all got on well? Yeah. Wow. That's very special people because yeah. not everybody did this. No, of In course fact, not. Uh, many yeah. didn't do yes, it. Yes, I was lucky. Extremely lucky because yeah. there's somebody... I mean, this gentleman, I didn't know him, he didn't know me. And, and they, they were, I'm, I'm assuming, yeah, I mean, but they I weren't... Called, they, I called him uncle. I'm sure they weren't very wealthy, he was also an immigrant. Well. Yeah. He was well. And all the years, but I mean, huh? he was wealthy. Yeah. No, but Afterwards, but not, 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 in, not in the beginning. During the war, life was difficult. I mean, he wasn't wealthy. Yeah, during the... He yeah. tried to establish yeah. himself. He was the annual huh? <laughs> He was the annual knew, and I said, you knew him, yes. And they left his wife, left my mother, Yerusha, and that's how close it was. Can I ask, in these pictures of your early years, who is in the, in the picture with you um, at the bottom? In this picture? Uh, that, uh, <laughs> the, the, that's me and that's Ruth Kugelman. And you remained close all the years? Huh? You had a close connection all the years? Yeah, with yeah. Marianne. With, with Mary and Ruth died already a few years ago. Ruth didn't have, Ruth didn't have much connection with Mary and I did, yeah. I remember school in Liverpool. And um, Rose, can I ask, from, from the remainder of your family, those that had gone, came to, to well, it was Mandate, Palestine, Israel, did you have a connection with other uncles and aunts? Yeah, yes. We, after I was married in 1950, we came to live here. We went to a kibbutz. And, uh, and I met all my aunts and uncle, my, my uncle. I mean, I knew them from before, but I hadn't seen them since well, for 15 years or something like that. When I saw me, I said, what's happened to your blonde curls? <laughs> I'd gone brown in the meantime. And then you went back to England? Yes, and then we were here for six years and then we went back to England. And you were living in, in Gateshead? Gateshead, yeah. And through the years, did you um, have any communication with other kinder transport children? Uh, or? Well, we, uh, there used to be uh, reunions. I mean, there were a few people whom I uh, eventually got to know that they were on the Kindle Times. Some people you knew and didn't know they were on the Kindle Times, we found that out later. Uh, when we came, when we came back here in 1972, and not long after, there was a reunion here. Uh, it was uh, <coughs> in the Ramada Hotel. We lived opposite. The last evening there was uh, a dinner and uh, I said, we, we, did, also we didn't know anybody. My husband met somebody who we was in yeshiva with and he didn't know anybody either so we decided to sit together at the table. Then somebody called someone the other people that Tzita, the name Tzita isn't, don't hear very often. And I look at her and say, are you Tzita? I can't remember what her surname was. She said, yes. I was on Hasharab with her <laughs> years before. And I look at the other people and I says, you're Ruth Richmond and you're Tzifa Delba, yes. <laughs> All people whom uh, I knew. I never read this dinner, the reunion of uh, Kinder Transport. And the family that took you in, you you kept a very close connection all the years. Yeah, yeah. That's that's really wonderful. That's yes, I mean he was until the last last minute. He was very uh, concerned. I mean, when once I started working and I earned money, and then I sort of started buying my own clothes, he wasn't got annoyed with me. And did they have their own children? Yes, they have two children. Yes, I have two children. And you were close with your children as well? Yeah, I keep in touch with one of them. That's wonderful. Very nice. Hmm? Very nice. Yeah. And then something very special happened. The town that you grew up in, in Germany, uh, they wanted to make the special stones, the, and they invited your family to come. Yeah. yeah. 
So could you speak a little bit about when you got the invitation? Uh, my, my grandson got an invitation. Yeah. He got a, an email one day from somebody who was doing, doing a project in the town, the school was doing a project against anti Semitism. And he got in touch. Is he any relation to my mother? And and he went to all the street. I mean, I never heard any more. He asked me, do I mind if he goes? No, uh, if he wants to go. Never heard yeah. any more about it. He's the oldest grandson. He was in Manchester today. Then, he did all the Then things. one day, my, my son phoned. And he says, we're going to Germany. I said, who's we? He's going, and all his sons, and two daughters, and a couple of daughters in law and a couple of grandchildren. <laughs> I said, how's this come about? Well, this Schleimer mayor, he thought, he mentioned it to one or two of his brothers, he said, maybe two or three of them will go. But he talked to one or two, and they talked to another one or two, and then, and that was eight, there was my son phone, told me this, it was 18 people were going. And from then, it snowballed when they had our phones. She and her sons want to go. My daughter from America phoned. She's got a surprise for you. Her daughter is booked to go. Uh, and that's the way it went on. And you didn't want to go? I didn't want to go. I, I couldn't have done it anyway. I couldn't have walked around all day. But can I ask, in all the years, did you ever go back to Germany? No. You wouldn't go back? I wouldn't go back. I don't know. I thought if I go back, I'd be looking behind me all the time. Uh, I thought that I wouldn't feel safe going back. I mean, my, my relations, once I came to live here, they all went back to von Wessels to Germany. Quite regularly. And the German, you have a book. Uh, if you could just show us the book of the German children in the class, they wrote a book. If you could show, it's a very special project that the, the school children did. <laughs> A tuck book. A tuck book, di diary. A diary of uh, diaries. And were you very touched when you when you read what they had written? What? How did you feel when you read what the the school children had written in the book? Uh, I don't know. It's it's it's, it's written very peculiarly. It's, it I mean it doesn't reflect on me. It's. It's, uh, they wrote what they thought I would feel and what I would be saying under the circumstances. <laughs> but it's a nice project that they did. It's, uh, and in the town, they did, uh, these are the, I think they asked your permission if you would uh, want to have it they, done. They asked if well, it, they did it without permission. <laughs> <laughs> they did it without permission. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they've done it all over all over Europe, different countries they've done it. You didn't want to do it in the beginning? No. How come? What? Why not? What? You, you, that you were against doing the... Because I thought, what, what you hear of what goes on in Germany, the anti-Semitism, that it would be destroyed. But in a way it's, it's done the opposite. It's, it's yeah, a, yeah, so it seems. So here they have, this is a copy of... With that tiny, you can hardly see Because the whole street's cobbled. <laughs> they don't wow. stand out at all. It looks amazing, but when you actually see it, it's very small. You can just pass it and not see it. But having been there, I want you to know that that project looked very authentic. You think, you think of students, 15, 16, mm -hmm. what do they really care or know about? But they seem very, very authentic in their project. They made a very good impression. They, they translated, they said in German, they translated into English first. And here we have um, your the, the kiva of your... Hey, my grandfather. That is, uh, they couldn't find it. Hmm? That was amazing. And where, where did they find it they eventually? Know, um, in, uh, it's not in Kassel. The, the, the can't find and there's a lady, an 80 year old lady and she knows all the quorum. A Yiddish lady? Uh, yes. And there's no such cave. 
my grandson already said to his, mother, to his father, said, let's forget it, it's not there. But my son says, no, I'm, I'm positive that it's in Kassel. Other things that I wanted to know, I wasn't always sure about. Said, but I'm positive about that. But my uncle from America used to go every two years after the war to Germany to visit Cape Elvis. And he went to Kassel. And my daughter from America, she came in the last minute. They left the day after Schwoos to go. So she had to go to Europe before Schwoos. Because the time difference, she wouldn't have managed. And she was staying at my son in Gateshead. And we talked about this, but they can't find the cover. So she said, she's got a photo of it. My uncle gave her a photo, I never knew that. But she didn't remember where it was. When they were on the way from Gateshead to, to the airport in Manchester, <coughs> in the middle of the night, she found America. <coughs> and so just told her son to have a look in the drawer in the living room, and he found it. So uh, she phoned my grandson and said, she's got it. He phoned the person in Germany who was arranging him. He's not Jewish, but he looks after the quarry. And he says, well, send it to him. And he did, and a few minutes later he phones back, he's found it. Once he knew what it looked like. Because it was the other way, the same was the other way around. It wasn't standing up. Uh, also, it was, it was covered with mud. It was, it was covered very, with mud and sand. It didn't look like the picture. And you can only read half the name now. And they found also this is the, the town in the mikveh. And the mikveh still, it's still there today. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, they can't stop it or something like that. And are there any Yidden that have gone back to the town? What? Are there any Yidden living in the town? Any no. Jews? No. No. They love no. the town. They are German Bechali Mashram on beautiful country. Well looked So I just want to ask you, Doris, what is your impression of the kinder transport? If people ask you, they say over 10,000 Jewish children were saved but unfortunately some went to non-Jewish families and don't even know that they're Jewish. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean everybody was very grateful to the British. But I mean, so there was, <coughs> so there was a Nishé meeting and they had a quiz. And uh, one of the questions was, do you, stay, do you stand up and uh, play God Save the Queen? So somebody says, no, why should I? There's another one who would come from Germany said, yes, she does, because for the sake of them, she's here. Hey, Doris, if I can ask you, during all this time, when you heard that your parents, unfortunately, were taken to Auschwitz, your emunah, did you always retain your emunah? Did you always have a deep belief in Hashem? Yeah, yeah. It didn't diminish or it didn't? No, I mean, from what one heard, I mean, at the beginning of the war, the family wouldn't let me read the newspaper. But then one day from school we had a project, I don't know, you had to read something in the paper and report on it and something was so from then on I read the paper and I mean, you knew what was going on. And when I was at this, I mean, from the day the war was declared, I said I won't see my parents again. You felt it. Yeah. And and did you always feel you wanted to remain from? Yeah. It was never a shadow that you. No. I think this is what your it's family it's instilled it's in you. They instilled. That's, that's that's all I knew, and that's how I grew up. And, uh, And what message do you impart to your grandchildren and the future generations? I don't know. What do, what do I impart on you? <laughs> we we'll look forward. We always say look forward and look back. Well, that's what my mother said to me on the way. Before I went to, the day before we went, I went to, to the train 
we went, I went with my mother to Casa to buy clothes and uh, she gave me a, a diary and she wrote in it, look forwards, never back. That would be our life. It was in German. And uh, to, to that, and then she wrote, as Ende nie unterglück, and oh, it will never stop our luck. <coughs> and do you remember your, your father's last words, what he said to you? Do you remember what your father said to you? Any of the last no, words? No, I don't remember. And I think this, it's to always to look forward. It's a, it's a very, very positive message. Yeah, yeah. And having brought up a family and seeing children and great children and great grandchildren, it must give you a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, a lot of it's, un it's unbelievable. It's, uh, <laughs> and, and I just want to ask you, Doris, that decision that your parents made, to send you is possibly the hardest decision a parent could ever make. Yeah, yes. I and mean, that's what they stress on this last uh, reunion for the kinder transfer. It was much harder for the parents than for the children. Yeah. I mean, some of the children were so young that you didn't realize what, what was happening. And you were never upset with your parents for for sending you, because there were some yeah. children that yeah. resented that their parents sent them. Yeah. They, they didn't know, they were... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were grateful, looking back, you were grateful. They made yeah. a sacrifice, they made yeah, the they ultimate made sacrifice. They made the sacrifice, of course. The ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. And that saved your life and future generations, Baruch Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's uh, over a hundred of them. Baruch Hashem and Harash. Can you, I just want to thank you. Um, this, um, so I just want to thank you. Um, um, I just want to thank you so much. And uh, it's been the greatest honor and privilege to be with you. And just wishing you. How, how did you find out about me in the first place? Through uh, Mishpoche, your great, it's a great grandchild. So I just want to thank you, Shulani of Nachas and Mazla and Brocha. I'd made this stream in good health and all of Hashem's blessings. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen.